Uh, tonight we're going to do some lightning talks, and these lightning talks are between five and ten minutes, so they should go pretty fast. And we only have actually one, two, three, four, five, six of them. And if they go over, you are welcome to throw fruit at them, rotten fruits. <laughs> we understand it's the end of today, and everyone's tired and wants to rest up for tomorrow. So, um, starting first will be Alejandro Serrano speaking about hole-driven development with GHC Mod. Please welcome him to the stage. No, no, I only have five minutes, please. OK. Uh, OK, this is Emacs. You know it. Some people love it, some people hate it. It's OK. OK, so we are going to define today this function f. It's everything we are going to do it. So I'm, I'm sure you've already done it into your head, but the, the point is, uh, using this uh, GHC mod, which is just a small uh, application you can install and then integrate into, into, G, into Emacs, you can, you can sort of do it like a conversation with your code mod, more than actually writing your code. So I have this here, and, and if it's red because if I here, they, it, I don't have anything for F. So I can just press a lot of, a lot of keys, <laughs> and then I get, uh, I get this. And then you see that the, uh, here, this thing is, is now purple. And, and uh, this is telling us that this is not an error, it's something different. It's something that was introduced in the thing, the, the previous to last version from, of GHC, and it's called a hole. And this hole is something that you are telling, I don't know what's yet, so please try to type check as, as much as, as you can, and, and give me some feedback information so that I can continue working. So, uh, if I, if I do uh, this, uh, you can see that uh, so you, you can see that now it tells me like it found a hole with this type, so that's what the compiler as, as, as is asking you to write, and it tells you, oh, you have some relevant information here, so maybe you can use it. So we are not going to use it yet. But we can use uh, other interesting information, the G, uh, other interesting feature from, from GHC mode, which is that you can uh, case split uh, just also by, by pressing a key. So you do it like this, and then you know it's a maybe, so it can tell you, OK, it has to be either nothing or yes. So this is done all automatically. And now your, your, your things change. So if if I go there, the hole just changed to some other stuff because, uh, well, there, it's not the same information. You no longer have any, any variable, so there is no relevant bindings apart from the, from the function itself. So this way we can, we can uh, keep working on our program. If we, for example, know here that we don't know what's going on there, but it's going to be something with just. So what we call is, what we do is, is call uh, refine. So you can see here, refine with. And I will tell them, OK, I know it, there is something going on with, ah, that's not what I wanted to do. So there is something going on with just. So please use it. So now we have another thing that we have to, to, uh, to complete. So if, if we ask now, well, uh, mm -hmm. when, when it works, ah, it tells some other stuff. So, we know that we need something of type A and A, and we have this binding. So we have X, which is of type A and F. So yeah, we can sort of continue this conversation with the code and say, OK, I think, ah, sorry. It's, I'm trying to be fast, but I'm just it's typing all the time. So I think I, I, would, I want to use this duplicate function. So again, we can continue. So the, the thing is we can make this conversation with our code. The, gui the types guide us <laughs> what we can use in every moment. But it, it becomes even better because we have here nothing. And what can we do? We have to return a maybe. So, so yeah, just let it write it for ourselves. So just, this is what we had to do. We only had to press a key and, and we had our program. Actually, we, are, we have been working a lot tonight. So it could be better. If we could just say, oh, please, mm -hmm. it, please give me all the possible completions. So what can I do with this function? It can be either nothing, 
or the case statement, and if we just want this, it does it for us. Uh, so yeah, that's basically uh, your takeaway. If you if you use this, you can have a conversation with your code. Actually, you don't need to use uh, Emacs. You can use just uh, one of these uh, underscores, and it is just just a hole, and uh, GSC will give you all the information. So I know that everybody thinks that this is magic, apart from the people who has been using Idris or Agda, which has like hundreds of times something nicer than this, but the, the, the nice time you, you think your type is something you impose for some invariance? No, no, it's actually something which is helping you to write your program. You actually could have written this program automatically for you just because you wrote the right type. So that's all. Programs that write themselves, I like the sound of that. Okay, next up we have um, Gershom Bozerman. Yeah. Who will be speaking on the topic of code literacy is literacy too? So yeah, th this talk is a soft topic. Uh, there's no code. Uh, there's no uh, CSI. Code. I think an important idea that would be very hard uh, to implement, but I think the people who are interested in education about computer science and programming more generally um, would. Uh, I think like to maybe think about and and anyone that could have an impact in this direction and uh, w one way to think about this is uh, people know Simon Peyton Jones is working less on Haskell because he's spending a lot of his time with this enormous program to sort of bring uh, you know computer science to all the schools in Britain and they have to teach all these teachers that don't know how to program themselves how to teach kids how to program there was an article about this that pointed to lessons from uh, lit literacy um, teaching of literacy. Because the point is you don't know how to teach kids how to program, and so may, you can do bad things. Like, uh, for example, they taught kids um, in the 50s with simplified spelling, so you, you learned phonics more quickly. It turned out they learned to read very quickly in the simplified way, and then for years afterwards they couldn't spell words the right way. So maybe the article pointed out that there's a relationship to um, when we teach programming, maybe you shouldn't teach simplified languages, even if it makes it easier at first, because what, what if you can't graduate from it? Maybe it's different, maybe it's not. The research isn't all in. And um, so this is sort of a part of a broader, I read this article and related to the topic of this talk, so I thought I'd start there. And here's the point, is if we take code literacy seriously, we should look at all the lessons from literacy education. And the most important for me is a program called Writing Across the Curriculum. And I don't know how many people have heard of it, and I actually went to the homepage for it, and it's at uh, University of Colorado Boulder. And, and here's the elevator pitch for Writing Across the Curriculum is, you know, they teach you to write these five paragraph essays in school, right? But they're not about anything. You're writing just to write to the essay format. And what they said is, no, we need to teach you to write in your physics class. We need to teach you to write in all your different classes about the topics in that class. Not only because that's the only way you learn to write as you do in the real world, and not only to write these five paragraph essays that no one ever wants to read, including the teachers, right? They're a genre unto themselves. They are not real world essays. And we have the same problem with code, right? We're, we're teaching toy code, we're not teaching real world code. And we're not teaching in the context of other disciplines. And the argument writing across the curriculum makes is that doesn't just serve teaching writing. That ter serves every other discipline. Because when students write, they have to think and they have to express their thoughts and it helps them become better in the class by doing so. And I would make the case that this is the case with computer science too. We have fields like the digital humanities, people who are writing scripts, to analyze corpi of text in, in literary studies, historians. When you do uh, art research, you, you might have to analyze um, sort of, you know, traces of paint and uh, other things. And you have to process numbers and you write Python programs to do so. And you do this in, in studying the environment. And then your code leaks and it's full of comments about how it doesn't make sense. And then there's a big scandal, right? So one way that people try to fix this is about reproducible and verifiable research. The other way we have to teach, try to fix this is to teach people to write code as communication, to teach people to read code, I think, as maybe 90% of some of these classes so that you can read other people's code. It's coming to be, you can't read a scientific paper unless you can read the code behind it. So we're going to have a generation of people that if they want to read scientific papers, they need to be able to read the code artifacts that comes with it. Otherwise, they can't believe it for themselves. And so what I'm suggesting is that we need a computer science across the curriculum program. 
that, or a programming across the curriculum that partners with many different fields and tries to put elements of this, of reading code, of taking it seriously, as something that is, it's not a part of everybody's life, but it's a part of your life if you're in academia or the schol uh, nearly any scholarly field these days. And um, we don't know how to teach programming this way. We don't have departments set up for it. We have departments where their whole job is to teach people how to teach English and to study what it means to teach English and how students learn English. We don't take programming seriously like that. It's a different problem than the problem we try to solve when we write better type systems. But I, I think it's going to be the bigger problem that we face. And uh, I just like to throw that out there as a topic for people to think about. And the words writing across the curriculum as uh, one of many things that people can Google to think about this. And uh, uh, you know, maybe start a conversation in that regard. Thank you. I'm teaching my six-year-old how to functionally program, so I'm, I'm a big fan of teaching kids at a young age how to at least do the basics in programming. So next up, we have Zishan Lakani. Hope I'm not butchering your last name. Uh, who will be talking about Feel the Rush CR... CRDTs. ...ETs in React. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sure this the red plug. <laughs> Sorry, uh, oh, there we go. There we go. Oh, 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 there we go. Uh, something specific to distributed systems, which are CRDTs. Uh, in the general sense, we call those uh, conflict resolution data types. Um, and I'll explain what that is. Uh, I work at Basho, so we work on distributed system problems and eventual consistency. Uh, I also uh, am a founder and organizer of Papers We Love. You ever heard of it? All right, so um, when we think about eventual consistency, I mean, there's a lot of consistency models out there, but eventual consistency is a really tough one. We want it because it has high availability. And that's what a lot of systems we use have. But in the world of high availability, in the world of uh, concurrency and distributed systems, um, this one paper actually comes to mind all the time. It's the famous Lamb Fort paper, Time Clocks and the Ordering Events. Uh, it never gets old. And um, uh, you know, he says specifically in the paper, you can, um, um, can only um, say, something that ha that say that something happened before. Uh, with physical clocks, uh, because of failures, because of location, uh, when we're trying to um, get an ordered history of events, it's very difficult. Uh, physical clocks um, might not work uh, and actually don't work a lot of times because we live in a world of failure. There, you know, the, I, I tried not to mention it, but we maybe heard the term cap. I won't get into it, but there's a better, there's a better term of harvest versus yield. And uh, that's uh, the true debate of consistency and availability. And I, you know, what we work on in REOC, for example, is trying to do the best we can for yield. We do have a little bit of a harvest model for something else, but yield is the big thing we want to do. And physical clocks don't work. So then Ford came up with this idea of, of causal history, uh, and specifically the term that he used to, to kind of count causal history are logical clocks uh, to create these partial orders. So um, I have some events here, and then we're going to show what those are in the next slide. So uh, Lamport's paper. Uh, has these great, uh, what do you call, space-time diagrams, or kind of like these process graphs. Uh, and if you notice, so space is horizontal, and time is vertical. And you'll notice as we get to later when we talk about what CRDTs do, which in terms of mer merging data, uh, like merging uh, rep you know, replicated state, um, we think of that almost horizontally, because we're, we're dealing with writes over time and, and, and gets over time. But here, we're talking about time in a vertical way. So if you see here, um, we have that, these, these are, these are, if you, you know, I'm talking about earlier in the morrow, we're talking about like uh, uh, nodes, uh, processes, sending messages, this happens all the time. So we see that here, like Q1 is sending a message to, to P2, right? So like I say in the previous slide, so Q1 happens before P2, and it also happens before P3. But if you see, if you look at Q2 and you look at P3, those would be consistent, I mean, sorry, concurrent. So they would be con concurrent operations. Uh, they don't know anything else about each other. They're not, they're not, one's not sending a message to the other. They're happening concurrently. Yeah, it looks like from our view here, Q2 is happening before P3. That's what we can see. But what if something happened? What if a node, what if a node that has that process gets lost? Well, I don't know. I can't get that back. 
but these can be concurrent. These, these are happening at concurrent times. Okay, so um, CRT research has been around, uh, you know, we've, we implemented it in React as a, as a server side thing, and I'll show a quick example of that at the end, uh, about 10 months ago. But the research has been going on for a good amount of years, and there's still um, more and more and more research happening. Uh, the Shapiro paper um, uh, is the, the big one, and I have a footnote for that uh, coming up. But uh, the kind of safety that CRDTs uh, give you in a, in, a, in, in, again, we're talking about eventually consistent systems, is a strong eventual consistency. Um, in the sense that it's not a strong consistency, there's not, we're not talking about uh, something where we're implementing some sort of consensus like Raft or, or, or Paxos, where you might have latency. We're trying to be highly available, but we're trying to have, uh, we're trying to think about how state can be merged automatically um, based on certain components. Um, and, you know, we are at a functional kind of programming conference, so people like data structures, and these are data structures. And what they do, uh, and the biggest thing they do is that, you know, we're consensus uh, algorithms for, uh, in, st in strong consistent uh, systems are about coordination. With CRDTs, we're trying to do less coordination. Almost no coordination at all. Okay, so there's two types. Uh, this is from the paper. A uh, concrete study of convergent and communicative replicated data types. Recommend to read. There's a lot of footnotes on here. There's a lot more I can do than like in, in five to ten minutes here. Um, so there's two kinds. There's uh, an operations-based one. That's a commutative one on the bottom. Which uh, I'm not. Uh, there are. There's a lot of work going in this, but it, it's a little bit different because it takes into account that you need reliable broadcast to guarantee operations, um, and that's not something we really have in a lot of systems. So we're going to talk about the state-based CRDPs, which is applying change locally and propagating that state. Uh, again, we're talking about partial orders and about growing monotonically. Okay, so here's the hello world of distributed systems and then uh, Yes, we have two writes concurrently. The next read returns their union. Concurrent updates, uh, even on unrelated elements, uh, removed might be done. The obvious one we might see is from the Dynamo paper, Amazon. I don't know if this happened more in Amazon, but there were times when you go, okay, I'm gonna, I, I put a book in my cart, put another book in my cart, I remove that book, I go back to the cart later, that book's back. It happened, right? I mean, it definitely did. I remember a couple years ago, it definitely did. So, and that's because their semantic reconciliation uh, was a, a, kind of a, a, a more typical merge, uh, not with the, the kind of smarts that we're, put, that we're talking about in terms of state replication of serial DTs. So, okay, that's the hello world. We have this problem. Uh, how do we avoid having that, uh, that book come back in the cart later, even though I removed it? Okay, so... Um, this is the, the kind of a little bit of set notation for what a CRDT is. It's based on this idea of a bounded joint <laughs> semi lattice um, where we have state, this binary operator, and the smallest element, which uh, when it merges to is called the least uh, upper bound. Um, so here is, I think, uh, like a more simple example, and I'll explain one that we actually use um, with data and sets. But this simple example is the LMAX example, increasing natural merge function. You see that we have these pairwise merges. So, um, there's a couple of facts here. If you look at just, you know, if you look at um, that merge to five, that merge to seven, that merge to seven. So we're always monotonically increasing, okay? Three and five, when I do that pairwise comparison, that works, uh, that's idempotent, that is commutative, and it's associative. So this is a very simple CRDT that's kind of growing counter. Obviously, we have, there's much more complex ones, and the, the Shapiro paper actually lays out a lot of them, and there's always been a lot of work for that. So we say we have this, this merge operation. If I go back, this merge, these merge states, five, seven, then seven at the end. That's the least upper bound of that. So we say we have this merge operation. So for example, if I have uh, one replica A has a Haskell book put into my cart, and I have a replica B that has a scheme book I put into my cart, the least upper bound would be that, uh, that tuple, that set of A and B. That's what they would merge. They're different states. They're kind of different parent states, and then merge them together. Now, if you're merging Haskell and scheme books together, well, you, you must love functional programming, I guess. <laughs> um, so essentially, the least upper bound would be the smallest card state that's greater than or equal to both elements in the ordering. Okay? So if, if a least upper bound exists, which means you can do this kind of merging, then it's unique, and then conflict resolution is deterministic. So anytime I have those, uh, that, those kinds of elements again, I can merge state. I don't have to coordinate it. That's a really big deal when I'm trying to get high availability and trying to get fast results. Okay, so there's a, a one set we might use to fix this Amazon problem is this two-piece set where I have adds and I have removes. In this case, when I merge this, I see that I have A and B and B on the remove set. When I merge this, I'm only going to get A back. The problem here with this two-piece set is that if I want to put uh, B back in, so I want to put that book back in and see it later, that won't work. 
not in two piece sets. So there's something we have called an or set. Uh, the or set has, you see here, also adds or removes, but it has this unique tag associated, associated with it. We can call this maybe a, a logical clock, some logical counter that's increasing. Okay, so I see here I have A, B, and C here. We know that A exists. We see B gets removed, one, one, gone. We see that C exists two, because there's two insertions, but only one was deleted. So we still have C there. So we're going to end up with A and C in this final thing. It's from a, it's from a client uh, library uh, by Kyle Kingsbury called Mean Girls. But we're showing in React, we actually implemented uh -huh. this on the server end. Cool. Okay. So the, way, the one that I'm going to talk about to fix this Amazon problem is called the ORSWAT, to optimize optimized version of that set, the, uh, the observer move set. So the way we do the merge, though, when we think about least upper bounds, we're talking about uh, ver version vectors. This is going to be a whole talk in itself. Sean Cripps gave a great one at Recon called Vinci, uh, and also at Buzzwords some years back, um, eventually consistent data structures. But here are some basic concepts. Um, there is the sends dominates the concurrent. Concurrent we've talked about where, uh, I got the better slide here. Okay, and uh, so the sends is when A summarizes at least the same history as B, so it's seen all the same things at least. Uh, dominates, which the, that point uh, should go below. A is strictly greater than B um, because it has seen all the elements of B in at least one more. So it has one more operation. Okay. And then we have concurrent ones, where A contains at least one event unseen by B and B by A. So we can't automatically, we, we, we don't have any conflict there. Okay, so again, we talked about the uh, optimized observe remove set. This is actually will be implemented in Reoc for you on the server side. And you'll see how sim simple it is to do a client update. So the two-way comparison where we're trying to say, we're trying to merge replicas. So one, one node, because we're eventually consisting land, uh, we, can write, we can write different concurrent updates. One node can have a right here, and the other node has a right there, and we have to replicate and figure out the right history. Okay, so we have this concept of version vectors and dotted version vectors, like we talked about. So we figure out, hey, compare this. When, if we find that this dominates, then we know how to merge them. And also, we have the specific implementation. Could we use this thing called dots? Uh, to whole, uh, you know, I can go more into that. But it's a, it's, a, it's a concept where we can also only know the last previous uh, update to the counter. So I can say when I merge, I, only, I can keep that last update in a dot. And what we can do here is when we merge these version vectors, we can actually remove dots because we know that, hey, this, this has completely dominated the other. We've seen this entire history now. We can remove that. And we do a two-way comparison, the w node A to B's version vector and then B to A's version vector. And that's when we'll do the final set merge. OK, so this is an example of DVVs. Um, uh, it's a little small, but uh, the concept here is that there's a version vectors originally. So what we had in React was this problem beforehand called uh, false conflicts because I might have a right, I might have a right with no causal history, but then when I merge them, I'm just going to merge all the different variations there. But what happens, you would have a thing uh, where we might have sibling explosion, where we have a bunch of, a bunch of updates because we're always just merging and merging and merging, not knowing when to remove. Um, so DVVs have solved this. Okay. So in React, we have all these types. Under the hood, you, you look at maps, you look at sets, you look at registers, you look at flags, you look at counters. Under the hood, we have these special types. And there's a great library called React DT that has all this work built in. And here's an example of how we have it on our client API. Pretty simple stuff. I have a map. These maps are CRDT maps filled with nested CRDTs of sets, registers, counters, all this kind of data structures that we think about on a normal day. You can, you can map that into JSON in your mind, too, if you wanted to. So, this simplicity, for, from the user perspective, is operational simplicity on the user perspective. Under the hood, we're doing these more complex state merges because we, you know, we're writing concurrently. So uh, the point is, you know, distributed systems has a lot of, lot of uh, problems that we're solving, uh, eventually consistency, kind of like what people are solving now, I think, with uh, the various languages that we do. And it seems to be that CRDTs and functional programming happen a lot. There's libraries for ACA. Uh, and, uh, and, other, and other things as well, obviously Erlang, where this is built for. So anyway, a uh, little bit of distributed systems for you. Thank you. OK, next up we've got Ben Burdett, who is going to talk about um, an ARM-powered musical instrument that was written in Haskell that's actually sitting out there. I don't know if anyone's had a chance to play around with it, but if you haven't, you should. Speakers only area. <laughs> that's not speakers only area. So go in there and play with that thing. It's a pretty th fun thing to play around with. I see the my first slide, but we'll just go on with that. Yeah. 
So um, back in 2013, I got persuaded to work on, uh, I got involved with the Boulder Hackerspace, which is a group of people who are interested in physical computing and electronics and things like that, and um, doing some audio stuff. And uh, me and a friend um, got caught up in making this accessory for this thing called Sound Puzzle. Um, and why not functional? So we went and <laughs> I was interested in functional programming anyway. And sound puddle is this dome. And you go inside the dome. Ah, can you? Yeah. Uh, so you go inside the dome, and inside the dome is this spectrogram. <coughs> and um, basically, uh, when you make a sound, it radiates from the center outwards along these spokes. And each spoke represents a different frequency. So people go in there and sing Bohemian Rhapsody or, or whatever. And um, so we, our idea was to make something that would control the lights with sound, using sound. Um, so what we came up with was this table. Um, it's kind of like a coffee table that makes sound. And it has a, it has a, it has a pedal for each, um, for each spoke in the dome. And um, I don't know if you can really see it in this picture, but this is where we had uh, six sensors hooked up to um, each one of the uh, each to six of the keys, and each sensor is a little infrared um, phototransistor, and so it detects distance to the key, and those things are super cheap, um, and so ended up making uh, you have to do everything 24 times with the keyboard like this. So this is what 24 of those looked like, and there are all kinds of crazy electrical problems and ended up making circuit boards for these things. Um, there was, somebody gave a little class on how to do it, and then it wasn't that bad. And uh, so we ordered, ordered the things, did a bunch of soldering, and had these boards, and had it all installed. And there you can see the little Raspberry Pi, and that's what we used to, to uh, scan the sensors um, and to produce audio. And I initially wrote most of that, well, pretty much all of it in Haskell, except for a few little uh, C glue pieces, um, and there you go. There's some uh, hapless victims playing the system, and uh, that's how it's supposed to be used. It's sort of a communal instrument for multiple people, um, and uh, so we wanted it to be solar, battery powered, and and uh, Raspberry Pi was a good fit for that. So the whole thing ended up being powered from one solar panel and a uh, um, duplex battery. So that. That worked out, and we needed real-time sound synthesis. Um, and uh, so hardware, we had a couple of Arduinos for the knobs and buttons on the top and for controlling the LEDs, because they have to be real-time real to uh, send messages to the LED chips. Um, and the phototransistors for key position. And then the banana pie, switch to the banana pie, which has a little bit more horsepower, um, especially for building GHC and stuff like that. Um, and uh, so initially, uh, I went with Clojure and Overtone and Java. Uh, the JVM ends up being a little too slow, unfortunately, because I really liked I really liked that toolkit. Um, and then I was like, well, I'll learn Haskell because there's a great book about Utopia, you know. And on page 250, it says that it's um, not real time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, I can't figure out these monads. And then it turns out that's not real time either. And that's why. Um, uh, but C sound is still cool. It's just that's about generating a C sound expression, which you just dump into C sound. And then C sound takes it from there, you know? And so you could tell C sound what to do externally. But I wanted to uh, kind of tweak things as I went. And so the Super Collider and HSC3 ended up being the tool. Then there's a new Super Collider controlling library out now that's supposed to be easier to use. I haven't used it. Um, so yeah, we ended up with C++ code on the Arduino. Uh, the, like, <laughs> it got down to the wire with Haskell. There's some sort of weird concurrency problem with sensor scanning and the serial port. And um, anyway, I ended up rewriting it in 24 hours in C++, and it's been C++ ever since. Uh, but the main, uh, the main brain part, uh, the coordinating engine, is still in Haskell. And, which I like it. Um, and uh, I already talked about HSC3. And then there's a little LED server, and you can send it messages to control the LEDs. Um, and yeah, there were lots of problems. Um, 
But uh, it was all overcome. If the thing works, um, the Jack and Debus, and I don't know if you, if you guys have messed with Linux audio, you know the sad tale. But, uh, <laughs> uh, eventually, with enough like trolling through forums, you find answers to most of the things you can ask me. Um, and there's still more latency than I would like for certain things. It works well as a melodic instrument, as a rhythm instrument. Drummers can sort of detect the latency that's there, so I'm kind of still looking for solutions for that. Um, and the Haskell thing, Raspbian Haskell was out of date, and I had to build a new one for Utopia. And that took, um, and I did that in Kimu, and it took four days to build. And then when I finished building it, it didn't work. Um, <laughs> and, um, so I ended up, now what I like is ARM. I mean, not ARM, Arch. Arch Linux for, uh, for um, oh yeah, these are the difficulties. I'll go to the next page. Um, yeah, the winds. Uh, so found solutions. Arch has a good experience for um, ARM, Linux, uh, ARM GHC, except that you have to downgrade LLVM, and those packages are not available. Uh, so you can ask me for those packages. Um, and they're on my blog. And uh, anyway, I, and I also had this great experience with compiling this stuff, doing complex changes in Haskell on my laptop, compiling it, sending it down to the ARM, and then it works on the first try. Almost eerie. Pretty great. Um, and it's crash free and reliable. And there's a bunch of new plans. I've, I'm make, working on a little web server for it um, with the lightweight and so the toolkit. Um, it's not really that lightweight, but it still works. It works great on, on ARM and various other things. Um, and I might give C sound another try because the guy is working on it a lot. The library gets a lot of attention. Um, so that's basically it. That's my experience. Pass goal and ARM. Thanks. <laughs> Two more lightning talks left. Uh, next one will be by Vincent Marquez on the topic of trampolines. Or the John Monad, as he promised me earlier. You were lying about that, were you, Vincent? No, no. no. <laughs> you want to mic? All right, um, this is talking about stack safety and ways of handling that in Scholar. So I'm Vincent Marquez. There's my contact information if you guys want to see more about this. Um, so I was talking to my friend the other day. He's got this Java project, and I convinced him to switch to Scala. And he had this big method that was doing this procedural way of generating uh, time intervals given a date range. And so I was like, look how cool I can rewrite it in this short amount of code. But there's a problem. You guys see the bug? So, um, well, what's the problem? Well, if I give it too big of a date range, it's going to overflow the stack. I'm going to get an exception, uh, right? Like if I do it a few thousand times on my local machine, it'll it'll throw a out of memory exception. So, well, what's a stack overflow? Uh, that's what Google says a stack overflow is. I'm going to say it's when you nest too many functions. It's going to take up too much memory space, and if you don't return, you're going to get an exception. So this is a problem. So Scala C can help us prevent stack overflows when we recurse if we make sure that the last method call in an execution path is itself, right? So you guys have heard of tail recursion. So this is what. So I, I rewrote this, right? This, this is what I changed was instead of Instead of returning the method and then putting it into a data structure as the last thing I do on the, the if path, I'm going to build up the data structure as I go. And then once I'm done recursing and the else, I just return it and no stack overflow. So this is called kind of the accumulator idea. Um, so whenever you're doing this uh, recursive call, you want to think, OK, can I, can I build up the data structure as I go <coughs> rather than returning it and then putting in the data structure? But sometimes that's really difficult. Let's say we have a tree structure, right? Like a file system is a good example of a tree structure. Um, it's not as easily apparent sometimes how you can make an accumulator, or sometimes you can make an accumulator, but it's just really inefficient to add to this like tree structure um, as you go. So is there a better way of doing this? Um, 
Oh, and the funny story is the, the two strings. So uh, even if you make the stack safety, the REPL will stack overflow when it tries to print it. So uh, I'd override <laughs> <laughs> the strings uh, call there. So okay, this is my first attempt, right? Uh, of generating. I just wanted to generate like a really deep file system um, that had a bunch of files at the end. Um, and it seemed pretty easy, right? I was like, okay, well, I'll just I'll just make files. And then I'll stick those in the directory, and then return the directory, and then stick that in more directories, and then traverse all the way up. And right, well, no, because I'm making my my recursive call rec inside the map, and then passing that to the directory. So again, I was like stuck. Okay, so how do we fix that? <laughs> Trampoline monad to the rescue. Okay, this is kind of crazy. So I'm gonna go to the next slide, right? Oh, What's wait. a trampoline? <laughs> so this works, right? Like th this works, but I'll, I'll, how about we we explain what a trampoline is? Okay, so I wrote my own trampoline to get rid of all the the cruft, um, the, the important stuff. But it's just, uh, the, but this is just kind of the 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 uh, platonic ideal of a trampoline monad, right? So what am I doing? Instead of uh, I'm either returning something with m with no more, right, as value, or I'm saying that. In the future, I'm, I have a computation that takes a value, and then I want to return another trampoline. Okay, so, and, and it's a flat map, so I, I can I can comprehend over it. I can use it as a monad, right? And but the interesting thing is, unlike other monads where I, I call the monad in the flat map, I'm not doing anything with it. I'm just building up a data structure of computations. So maybe this will make a little bit more sense. The important thing to to see here is. So if you haven't seen sequence before, it's just flipping the, the list of trampolines to a trampoline of lists, right? So I'm doing the same thing, but, but what I'm doing is I'm returning a trampoline of the file systems. Uh, so that map call, that bottom map call right here, is happening on my trampoline of lists. And that's why I'm not actually doing a self-recursive call. I'm building up this data structure. And then there's a magic run method. Um, I actually have a run method committed to my repository for this talk, but um, that's kind of gross, so I didn't want to subject you guys to that, but it, that, that, the, my trampoline does work also. This is uh, showing Scala Z's trampoline, um, but I have examples of both in my repository, so check that out if you don't believe me or if you're curious how the run works. Um, yeah, you can check that out. But when does trampoline fail? This is the example I've been passing around uh, the Scala Z chat room for a little while. Whenever we have a monad uh, transformer, and we know we're going to flat map on itself a ton, intuitively we think, OK, well, doesn't the trampoline solve the problem, right? Like, the, we're going to stick a monad, uh, or a trampoline inside a monad, and then um, that way the, the base monad, the trampoline, will, will give us stack safety, right? It doesn't, though. So why does it die? OK, let's look at the flat map uh, call from Scala Z. See, see what's happening when I call f.bind? It's applying the monad before it's comprehending on the trampoline. So this is going to fail. It's going to call apply on the state, which then may have another state, and it's going to call apply. And it's going to go all the way down before we ever get to the bind of the trampoline to build out our computation. So it doesn't work. Bind happens in the wrong spot. So are we hosed? That's the question. Like, is it just like, oh, I guess that was it. Scala doesn't work. <laughs> no. Uh, so I was chatting with uh, John on Twitter about this, and he had an idea for a different trampoline. Or, uh, I mean, a different way to construct the state monad. So I implemented John's state monad. <laughs> Almost the same, except the whole computation now happens. The, the state threading happens inside the F. So in this case, we can make the F a trampoline. And so the important thing to note here is before we apply our state's function call, it's going to happen in the F, which in my case is the trampoline. So using the JD state monad, we can recurse 10,000 times, and there's no stack overflow. So that's how you actually run it. That's a little weird. We should work on that. Um, so maybe there's a better way of uh, actually executing it. But it does work. So the new, the reworked idea of how we would use a tramp, um, uh, transformer, uh, in this case state, 
um, makes a stack uh, safe. And the other option that it's a possibility is we can, um, and, and if you don't know what this means, look at the code or just ignore it because the other way probably is better. But we can, we can get rid of trampolines altogether and we can exploit the fact that the free monad gives everything uh, context of a functor in all states uh, are monads, which means they're functors. And we can just generate this computation, this, this free computation that our data structure that explains our computation, and then we'll actually fold over it and thread the state through ourselves. Um, this is a little hairy, though, because if we have futures in there, we have to call get on the futures, and um, that's not the worst place to do it, but I don't like that, so this can sometimes work for me, and it has, but I don't know if it's the best way to do it. Um, but other ideas, so this is an ongoing thing I'm interested in, so come talk to me and we'll talk more about it. So thanks, guys. How could I not clap for that one? I thought he was <laughs> shitting me. Okay, and our final talk is a talk on building a microservices architecture using Haskell. And this is by uh, Phil Freeman. <coughs> okay. Um, hi, my name is Phil. Um, I work at a company called Dicom Grid. We've uh, slowly been trying to integrate Haskell into our architecture, which you might describe as a microservices architecture over the last year. Um, I just want to give a quick experience report and hopefully give some advice for people who might be thinking uh, of doing the same thing. So um, here's what we make. Uh, we're a company, we're based in Arizona. We uh, make medical software for radiologists and patients to um, upload and view and share their medical data. Um, the company name Dicom Grid comes from a medical format uh, called Dicom that we use to trans uh, transfer data around. Um, so many of you might be in sort of the same position I was in a year ago where um, you know, I, I loved Haskell, but it was sort of difficult to find a way to convince people uh, that, that you know, it was a good thing to uh, bring into our environment. So um, how, how might you bring Haskell into uh, an existing architecture? Um, so for me, uh, we already uh, used quite a lot of languages. Um, so the list is here. I mean, I don't even think this is complete. But um, so in our production system, we have Java, Scala, Groovy, C Sharp, JavaScript, TypeScript, Perl, and Python. And I might have missed some. So if there isn't a better reason, so well, we use everything else. Why? why <laughs> um, but we, we do have this kind of um, attitude of, you know, we want to use the best tool for the job. And um, I like Haskell. Other developers, uh, some of our developers love Perl, some love, love Python, and uh, those are the languages that people are most productive in. So we want people to be able to use those. Um, and we, need, we have a need for correctness. We're a medical company, so um, both on the client side and the server side, it's good to be able to sort of assert things about your code um, and make sure that uh, the code is doing what we want it to do. Um, so Haskell is a very nice fit for that. Also, as I mentioned, we already have a microservice architecture. So, um, uh, sorry, if you're not familiar with the term, I just mean that we have a lot of small web services and components that we sort of glue together into a larger architecture. Uh, and that's a, that's a great sort of way to bring any language in, right? Um, you can just bring Haskell in in a small, um, isolated microservice. So a couple of the first attempts that I made to try and bring Haskell in were a couple of internal tools. I've been doing a lot of TypeScript development on the, uh, some of the front-end code, um, and I needed a good way to generate um, uh, you know, good uh, documentation from my code. Um, so I wrote a little tool using Parsec in Haskell uh, to go through. Um, you basically just uh, I, I read off the spec from the TypeScript uh, specification. Uh, you can just get the grammar from there. So it's a little Parsec application that uh, spits out some HTML using Blaze HTML. Um, so that was nice. That was like a nice way to prove that Haskell was kind of worthwhile. Um, and the other sort of big project that I've been working on for the past couple of years is PureScript. Um, so I've been trying to sort of find ways to bring that in as well. Um, and I have a couple of small projects for internal tools that use uh, PureScript and React for um, little front-end apps. Uh, so once I've sort of convinced people it was a good idea, um, we decided that we had a kind of isolated microservice called uh, XDS Server. XDS is another uh, little data format that we use. Um, so basically what this was going to do was just um, talk to other SOAP services and um, parse some data formats using Parsec and thing, a library called Serial. Um, that uh, is kind of like Parsec for binary data formats. Um, so I'll do some data munging and push things out to other web services. Um, and that's been running in production for nine months. Um, and it, you know, it was a great way to sort of prove that uh, Haskell was um, a viable option. Um, and now there's, there's four projects um, that are underway in the company. Um, the metadata service, which uh, 
wrap some of our database functionality and entities. Uh, permission service, which uh, is basically a little DSL for uh, scripting permissions in Nginx for authentication. Uh, XDS service I already mentioned, and messaging service is one for, um, there are some business rules up, uh, around uh, pushing uh, data in real time over WebSockets to clients. So uh, there's a little Haskell server for managing the rules there and uh, delegating things out. Um, so Haskell in the real world, I mean, I think a lot of people have uh, this impression that Haskell is really great for toy projects, but it doesn't really um, move over to real world code. And you have these things in real world code that you don't really have to um, worry about when you, you, you know, you're you working on these um, small toy projects. You have to uh, keep logs because if you're running something in production, you need to make sure that you can figure out why it broke, if it broke. Uh, you need to write to sort of real world data stores, databases, file sockets. Um, you need to track performance and make sure um, you're not sort of, you know, eating too much memory, eating too much CPU, etc. Um, but I think like my experience has been, um, there are a lot of libraries that I ended up having to learn, so web web servers and database libraries and things. But the exact same uh, principles that you apply when you're learning these toy projects that just apply in, in production uh, services, right? So you just follow the types, and you know um, things eventually will become apparent. There will be sort of patterns that you're not familiar with, but um, you know I think following the types generally seems to be a good way to. Uh, you know, gain familiarity with these libraries. Um, and a good sort of general tenet that I've uh, tried to apply is that um, you want to try and sort of separate out the pure core of your code, try and sort of push impure things and effects, you know, to the boundary. <coughs> um, and that's sort of a good thing to generally apply, I think, you know, even in uh, production services. Um, Haskell has a really, really excellent set of libraries for um, all sorts of like real world stuff um, that you might be surprised like how, how large this sort of like bank of libraries is. So here's, um, a lot of these actually are using pretty much all of those projects that I just showed. Um, but these are some libraries that we use uh, for things like um, as HTTP clients, web servers, uh, talking to readers, talking to uh, you know, Postgres, uh, things for frequency, <coughs> things for diagnostics. Um, yeah, so there's, there's something on Hackage for pretty much every real world thing you could want, I think, at this point. Um, so how we use Haskell very briefly. Um, like I said, you want to try and push effects to the boundaries. Um, and we have these various techniques and little tricks for um, you know, separating out pure code and DSLs. And we might use like a free monad for describing like the sort of signature of um, you know, a particular DSL we want or something like that. Um, and then there's a lot of little type tricks that go a really long way, even though they're sort of very, very simple ideas. Like don't use strings um, because you might sort of use uh, primary key where you meant to use an email address or something because you use string to represent both of them. So wrap them in new types so you can distinguish them in the type system. Um, and then, you know, Haskell has some types. A lot of languages don't have some types. That's a really, really simple way to just sort of assert basic things at, at compile time about your code. Um, transactional channels turned out to be like a really, really neat way to factor code into individual components that could sort of push data around um, uh, between, you know, uh, components with separate responsibilities. And then, um, you know, Haskell on the client. I spoke about uh, PureScript and React already today. Um, testing, a lot of really, really excellent libraries in PureScript, uh, sorry, in Haskell for uh, testing. A uh, quick check, obviously, something that you have in Haskell that you have in, well, not in the same way in uh, pretty much any other language. Uh, HSpec for sort of specification based testing, and then uh, tend to sort of glue it all together with test framework. Um, for packaging and sort of deployment, we run a Hudson based CI build. Um, and it turns out that uh, you know we just do a static link binary, so we just have a gigantic binary which we then just sync over to our production servers. Um, and we haven't really hit the problems of scale yet, where we might need something like a local hackage instance or Nix to do dependency management. But it turns out that you know it's extremely simple to push static binaries to the server, so that's worked pretty well so far. Oh, and Cabal sandboxes are really excellent for uh, sort of managing dependencies too. Um, a little bit about Haskell strengths, but I think I've covered quite a lot of that already. I'll try and wrap up. Um, Hiring Haskellers is kind of interesting. We don't really hire Haskellers directly um, to write Haskell, but it turns out that um, you know Haskell acts as a really excellent filter for uh, positions that uh, might not directly involve Haskell, um, and it, it's also kind of a really good way to retain uh, existing employees if they're interested in you know learning new stuff. Um, and we have uh, so it started uh, with me a year ago, working on the XDS server project, and at the moment we have. Um, <coughs> At the moment, we have uh, three employees learning Haskell in the company. Uh, yeah, so I should say, you know, come talk to me if you want to talk about Haskell in production or if you're interested in. Uh, uh, none of our jobs are exclusively Haskell, but you know, a little bit at least. Um, and just quickly about issues, um, debugging can be kind of tricky, and code reviews are uh, 
probably take a little bit longer than otherwise because we don't have that many Haskell people on staff. Um, one of the interesting problems was that we did run into kind of, um, you know, memory, memory and CPU were getting eaten quite a lot and, you know, the service would sort of um, go to 100% CPU after a month in production or something. It just kind of taught me the lesson that, like, you have to use these libraries from package, like uh, EKG is very good at uh, monitoring the runtime. Uh, monitoring memory uses, that kind of thing, and just keeping detailed logs uh, so you can try and figure out what goes wrong. Um, and we're trying to sort of um, push a lot of our code into uh, into open source uh, repositories. So we have a couple of very, very small libraries, tiny templates, just like a little string templating library, and that TypeScript docs te uh, tool that I talked about earlier. Um, but one of the interesting ones is uh, this DICOM library. So you know, the name of the company is DICOM Grids. So uh, you know, DICOM is the medical format, and um, it really, like, that format kind of, like, really sits at the core of our company, and, like, our IP. So I think we, we recently GPL'd this parser and uh, encoder for the DICOM format. So um, I was quite kind of proud that we were able to do that. So hopefully we can kind of get some contributions on that. Um, that's it, basically. So, uh, yeah, talk to you. <laughs>